Um, as a dance scholar, we know Cheryl Dodds is widely published, but she is as remarkable as a teacher, colleague and practitioner. Um, so in addition to everything that Michelle has introduced about her, I'm delighted to share this space with Cheryl, knowing of her immense knowledge and wealth of experience since I first knew her at the University of Surrey, short of 20 years ago or thereabouts. Uh, so welcome, Cheryl. We're truly delighted to have you. Let's go back to the beginning. When did your interest in dance begin to emerge in your studies? Oh, Katrina. <laughs> well, just of all, I just want to first of all say thank you so much for inviting me to speak and thank you to Michelle and Reem for your support as well. So when did my interest in dance first come into my studies? I'd say in some ways it was probably a little the other way round. I feel like um, dance came into my life first of all as a young child, you know, um, although I wasn't very conscious of it, I danced at family parties, we danced socially, um, at school when it was a rainy day, we danced, um, do English country barn dancing uh, in the school hall if it was wet. Um, as I got older, I started to do RAD ballet. I continued with uh, modern jazz, tap. Um, and I had no idea really that it was something that could be formally studied within a university setting. And it was really only in my mid teens, um, it was really before the A-level dance started. I think there may have been a few BTECs around, but I began to become aware that you could study dance in a university setting. And I think I went into that university setting having a lot of embodied experience, both in concert dance and dancing socially. And it was only once I was there that I found all these fascinating ways to study it historically, aesthetically, ethnographically, um, you know, all the different approaches you could bring to it. So I think the dance came first and then the studies came later. I'm gonna throw another question in. Um... Who were those key people that really inspired you as an uh, emerging academic? Oh, I've got to give a huge shout out to Dr. Um, or Professor Teresa Buckland, who I seem to have followed her my entire academic career. So she was the head of the dance department when I did my undergraduate at Crunel Sager. And then when I went to do my master's at Surrey University and then my PhD, she moved to Surrey University. So she both um, was involved in my master's and was one of my PhD supervisors. But the reason Tess was so important to me is she was the person who showed me that um, the it was possible to study dance outside of a, con a Western concert dance setting. So her background was in English folk dance. But I remember at the time of doing my undergrad, she'd been invited to write an article about pop music video for an anthology. And I had no idea that you could look at those kinds of dance within, you know, a university setting. And I remember her quizzing me about all the different pop video artists I like for this chapter. So it was really Tess who pushed me to see what dance could include within the academy, but also ways of studying it that really engage with the people involved through ethnographic methods. So let's move on to your first book, Dance on Screen. And I remember, I wouldn't say I remember it being newly published, but I started my MA studies in 2003. So it really was, oh, Cheryl's new book. So that's really sort of um, how far I go back in terms of knowing your research. Um, dance on Screen, published in 2001, focuses on dance through the visuality of media as it was back then, mostly we talked about VHS and DVDs. Life has moved on from then. Um, how did your research unfold alongside teaching in the United Kingdom, notably at the University of Surrey? So it feels like I want to talk about sort of, you know, your trajectory through teaching in higher education. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I feel I was incredibly fortunate that I've always worked at institutions where I've been able to teach my research area. 
And I think it says a lot about how forward thinking Surrey was in terms of what could go into the curriculum. So, you know, when I started at Surrey, um, already it was teaching a diversity of styles. So there was ballet and contemporary dance, but also African people's dance and Katak at the time. So it was a, a really open minded place about the, the, the wealth of dance practices that could fit into the curriculum. So um, almost as soon as I got a job there, I started teaching a dance on screen class, um, a course for the undergraduates. And eventually I um, did one for the, the master's program as well. And it's interesting. I always feel that my teaching feeds into my research and then my research goes back into my teaching. So it was great having some really young students who were very interested in you know, pop music video, the burgeoning field of dance for camera. They were really alert to um, dance, you know, in, in things like television commercials. So it felt like I was always being introduced to new areas of dance on screen through my students. Um, and then it would feed back into my research again. And, you know, again, I, I was also asked to teach a course, at the time it was called something like a uh, 20th century social dance. And eventually that shifted into a class, a course called, um, I think it was called Dance in Popular Culture or Popular Dance, something like that. And when I was teaching that, I realized, although I was super interested in popular social vernacular dance, I kept on using this term popular dance, but hadn't quite figured out what that meant. And it was because of that teaching, I then went on to do my next book, which was all about the problem of what is popular dance. Absolutely, Dancing on the Canon Embodiments of Value in Popular Dance, published in 2011. Mm. Um, I mean, it demonstrated in a way your keen interest in participatory research, where, you know, burlesque became one of mm. your performance strands as an academic. Uh, what was so unique about this field of research, if particularly in, in, in popular dance? Yes, yeah. So, um, you know, it brings together so many influences and interests in terms of the, the burlesque research. So when I did my master's, so another hugely influential person was the late um, Professor Andre Grove from Roehampton University, who was instrumental in introducing me to ethnography fully. So when I did my master's and she taught me, I did an ethnographic study of female striptease in London. And again, that was, although I think that would be very commonplace nowadays, it was a, at a time where the academy was still dominated by the study of, of Western concert dance. So to have someone legitimize my area of interest and to support me in doing that was really important, but also um, to be able to learn the uses of speaking to people about their practice. So rather than just observing them from afar, but actually engaging with participants um, who nowadays might be called collaborators, co-collaborators in the research, who um, could share with me their values, experiences, embodied knowledge of the practice was absolutely instrumental. And I'd say, almost since that time I've been using ethnography as a major part of my research. But what was interesting about the uh, neo burlesque striptease is alongside doing the ethnography, I was also beginning to practice it as well. Um, and it felt like it opened up some really interesting questions for me about, um, well, I guess some of my feminist interests about women's bodies and how they're looked at, but how we take pleasure in our own bodies and how we might do something like undressing as a performance, but how to make that provocative um, in both senses, <laughs> uh, erotically provocative and uh, provocative in ways that challenge ideas about how women um, are constructed in the world. So um, it, it was a great opportunity to both be both keeping up a practice with my own burlesque troupe alongside doing the field work, interviewing people. And, and again, it was a very transformative work in terms of talking to people always helps change and develop my thinking. 
I mean, that strand of the performative <clears throat> runs through your work and we will get to the B-Girl um, <clears throat> chapter in your um, <clears throat> professional life. But before we do that, there's a particular publication that I want you to talk to us a little bit about, and that's the Oxford Handbook of Dance and Competition, published in 2018. What drew you to editing such a, you know, an anthology, but what elements of competition and its relation to dance were you most mm. interested to bring um, as an editor to the community mm. of dance? Well, I think it struck me that living in a capitalist society, which is based on, um, or at least <laughs> in the Euro-American Euro context, which is based on um, a capitalist model, that actually competition seeps into all areas of dance. And um, at this point, I'd moved to the US and I'd started to do some work on hip hop battles. So within the um, African diaspora forms, ideas of contest, um, are a common part of the, the dance circles, so going up against people. Um, but the more I began to think about it, um, I realised competition seeps into many areas of dance. I'd watched a lot of um, films as part of my screen dance research that are based on some kind of competition that the protagonist has to, to win. So there's a lot of those kinds of films around at the time. Um, but I also realised that a lot of students that were beginning to audition for uh, my current university were coming out of competition studios. So their local dance studios, they were being trained into doing competition. Um, so I got incredibly interested about how competition seeps into all areas of dance um, and how that's rooted in the aesthetics, the economics and the social structures. Um, and I think I was less interested within just coming up with an easy answer as to whether competition is somehow good for dance or bad for dance, but actually thinking through the complexity of what does competition do to dance? How might it change dance? But also what dance does back to competition. So how dance is very smart at the way in which it can um, question and challenge competitive structures in a, in a variety of ways. So I think the complexity of what competition is really interested me. And it seems like it interested lots of other people because I think there's about 27 chapters in that book looking at widely different varieties of dance. And then of course, well, for those of you who um may be already familiar with Cheryl's um, professional trajectories from the United Kingdom to the U USA. Um, 10 years ago, you moved to Philadelphia to start work as professor at Boyers College at Temple University. Um, your research and teaching have moved into a slightly different trajectory. Um, and certainly thinking about being a B-girl performing um, in these sort of, you know, uh, competitions, um, but more importantly, starting to think about your research on different levels. Um, thinking about B-girl, thinking about the privilege of the body, uh, race as well, um, thinking about also being, I think you have a chapter and you called it being 50 and what was the title of the... It's, it's, <laughs> the chapter's Be Girl at 50. Be Girl at 50, absolutely. So um, ha, before we go into your, your presentation, are there any points that you'd like to sort of share with us ahead of going into uh, your presentation? How did you get into this? How did you, apart from living in Philadelphia? Yeah, sure. So to be, to be absolutely honest, I think I've always been interested in hip hop and hip hop dance styles. And actually when I, still when I was in the UK, it was really difficult to find an adult class in hip hop for beginners. Um, but just the year before I left, a friend of mine who's really steeped in a range of hip hop styles started an adult class. So that got me going to classes. So when I moved to Philly, I was really keen to find an adult class. And again, it was quite hard to find at the time, although now there's, there are quite a few of them. So I started a class in a range of hip hop styles. So it wasn't so much breaking or breakdancing as, as some people call it. It was a uh, locking, popping, hip hop party styles, house dance. So I started doing a range of classes and workshops. 
but as part of a new book, which um, Michelle mentioned, where I look at facial expression in popular dance, one of the areas I um, study for that are hip hop battles. Um, and to be honest, I didn't really intend to get into the movement side of things in such depth, but I ended up um, partnering with a hip hop company who, who use prep breaking to teach um, in, in the school system, the public school system in Philly. And I did a project with them. And as part of it, we were interviewing B-boys and B-girls about their experiences of battling and training and what life skills that gives you. And as part of that, being sort of the good ethnographer, you know, you go along to um, the field, you try a little bit of it out, you participate, or at least being a dance ethnographer, that's what you do. And at some point I realized that the ethnographic project had come to an end, but I was still turning up for these training sessions. And to cut a slightly longer story short, I just kept doing it and somehow I got absolutely hooked by the dance. So now I seriously practice, um, you know, multiple times a week. I battle, I go to training sessions. I do what's called a, a community cipher um, regularly. And it and although I've come to it very late, I, I take it seriously and I'm really passionate about it. So it feels like you've got another book going there from burlesque to B girl. <laughs> um, and I'll set you that challenge and we'll hopefully talk about it when we do meet in person um, at any other conference that, or any other event that we might meet at in person. Um, let's move on to your presentation and I'm going to hand over to you for the next 20 minutes. All right, well, I'm just going to do a quick bit of technical setup in my basement um, and just move my computer screen. And I think, there we go. I wish I could leave. My heart beats fast. I glance anxiously around, hands clammy, mouth dry. Pacing back and forth, I try to assume a look of ease. Inside, my stomach twists in knots. I pretend to look engaged. I feel a little nauseous. I think I need the bathroom. I don't feel good. I feel hot or maybe cold. Perhaps I should go home. I'm on the edge, anxiously two-stepping. Do it, Cheryl. Nope. Stay right where you are. Miss my chance. Next time. Now. Do it. And at that, I bound into the cipher. It might seem odd, but I do this for pleasure. I came to breaking somewhat on the late side. Now, aged 54, I've been breaking for over six years and I participate and compete as B-Girl S-Dot. I always want to thank those in the breaking community who generously helped me. So I give a quick shout out to those in the Philly scene who supported me and to my mentors, B-Boy Metal and Val May. Today, I want to reflect on ciphering, one of the most important components of breaking. The cipher describes the circle that dancers enter to show and prove what they can do. Hip hop scholar, Joseph Schloss explains, B-boys and B-girls view the cipher with an almost mythical reverence, befitting its status as the most authentic, challenging and raw environment for B-boying. As a somewhat anxious middle-aged woman, it was the cipher that I absolutely dreaded. The cipher offers a generative space for improvisation, contest and collegiality. And breaking itself is assumed to be a young person's dance because of its perceived athleticism, dynamism and power. Its virtuosity, coupled with its bravado and attack, made me wonder how my lack of confidence and aging body would ever be able to show and prove my B-girl chops. I therefore want to explore why I cipher, what is at stake in my participation, and what does it offer me at this stage in life? A small body of scholarship exists on the topic of dance and age, 
although much of this either attends to aging professional dance artists or community dance projects for seniors. Yet the literature concurs that age is performative, meaning that I don't have to act my age. While Western concert dance has privileged youth, other dance cultures actively celebrate elderly dancing bodies. In writing about tap, Wendy Oliver references the Africanist quality of a Phoebism, a form of vitality and exuberance regardless of age. Given that breaking similarly emerges from the African diaspora, it makes sense that it embraces this quality of dynamism and attack. Dance can accommodate older bodies and older bodies can adapt to the requirements of dance. In one of the few pieces of scholarship that attends, it, attends to aging b-boys, Mary Fogarty examines how dancers involved in the early developments of breaking must now contend with the scene as middle-aged men. She focuses on the care with which they currently manage their bodies by taking to time to warm up properly and by preparing for battles well in advance. She also argues that because breaking values inclusivity of all body types, b-boys and b-girls who are differently abled or whose body shape is not perfectly conducive to the dance style are welcomed and supported in the scene. Consequently, age should not be an obstacle. Although I fully anticipate that I will never win any battles or competitions, in theory, I should be able to cipher. In practice, however, it feels like a lot is at stake. The capacity to freestyle or improvise forms an important skill in the cipher. Here, in the heat of the moment, b-boys and b-girls respond to the music and articulate who they are through throwing down a round of personal and stylized movement anchored in the foundations of breaking. Although improvisation has often been conceived as a place of spontaneity, democracy and freedom, dance scholar Danielle Goldman offers a radical rethinking of these assumptions. She argues that practices of improvisation are more appropriately understood as a tight place in recognition of the constraints regarding race, gender, sexuality, class, historical era and artistic codes that delimit what and how we improvise. And I would add to this age and ability. Her idea of a tight place resonates strongly as my body confronts the limitations that I bring to the practice of breaking. My body is lifted and held according to the ballet and contemporary dance training that I pursued as a child and young woman. Therefore, I've struggled to achieve the grooving top rock, grounded footwork and inverted freezes demanded of breaking technique. Despite the performativity of age, I'm usually at least three decades older than my fellow dancers, and my body refuses to bounce back quickly from the hammering and contortions it endures while practicing. And my combined professional and domestic life limits my ability to attend daily practice sessions. So I often find myself breaking alone in the restricted spaces of my kitchen, bathroom, and basement. While the constraints I describe above concern age, experience and ability, their intersection with matters of race further complicate my presence in the cipher. I'm the only white middle-aged woman to attend my breaking practice session as the other dancers are predominantly young black Latino or Asian American men with few women visible in my local scene. Dance scholar Thomas de France describes how black bodies have close ties to social dance, and he calls upon Franz Fanon's conception of the social dance circle as that which protects and permits. Unlike concert dance, which he envisions as a white space open to outsiders who gaze upon black bodies, 
The circle or cipher ensures no such division. It's a space for black bodies to create community, showcase individu individuality and assert identity. What happens when a white woman comes to the cipher with a hope that she might participate? Through the work of feminist scholar Peggy McIntosh and further articulated by De France, I see how my white privilege has entitled me to occupy spaces both in the academy and in my research that assumes an unquestioned right to be there. Quite rightly, this experience of entitlement makes me feel ill at ease. I'm equally aware that while white privilege does not help me be a good B girl, and that my age and race alienate me from ever breaking participants, I feel that tightness as I hover on the edge of the cipher. And in turn, I can only imagine how the other dancers feel towards my outsider body encroaching upon their space. Despite the tight place that Do uh, Goldman accurately describes, I also experience an overwhelming openness. It feels as though, though the cipher holds so much possibility and I'm engulfed with choice. The openness renders me immobile and therefore unable to decide how to move and what to do within it. I'm faced with this dilemma many times and it's only when I'm given restricted choice that I start moving. Early on in my training, my instructors would make me improvise with a limited number of steps. And I slowly became accustomed to entering the cipher with minimal movement to hand. I pursued the painfully slow practice of drilling steps many times over until they're locked within my body. I design short combinations of movement that I hope will appear from deep within my muscle memory. I top rock in my basement for entire tracks, often riffing on just one or two steps so that I build stamina through sustained improvisation. And while I often forget my combos of material, lose momentum while freestyling, or throw in awkward moves from other dance vocabularies, I continue to practice. Gradually, a few things begin to click. Although I'm tempted to assume my skills as a B-girl will never amount to much, my age offers some attributes that shape how I approach the practice. I bring tenacity to learning breaking that I've acquired through life experience. I know that weaknesses in areas of knowledge can be developed through commitment, practice, and sheer grit. I recall that learning any new skill can be slow, challenging, and painstaking. I remember that I can stay on a plateau for a long period of time without any discernible improvement, and then suddenly various skills seem to fall into place. I've also experienced embarrassment, social awkwardness, and self-consciousness multiple times in my life, and while these are not comfortable experiences, I realize that it's more productive to chance defeat and exposure than it is to stay safe and hold back. The stepping out and taking risks allows learning to happen. Even though I still mess up, lose flow and crash, I'm comfortable and familiar with failure. My organized and diligent approach, approach to practice has served me well. For the longest time, I practiced footwork drills. I practiced each step individually and could never combine them as that seemed to distract me from my goals of mastering each one. I looked unadventurous, constantly working on the same moves executed more like an aerobic exercise than a dance style. Although I continue to drill them and there is still room for improvement, these steps now come out easily in the heat of the moment. 
The same goes for top rock. I struggled to demonstrate variety and flow. Therefore, I set about watching instructional videos. I recorded myself in the basement. I habitually freestyled when brushing my teeth or making the tea. These systematic and strategic approaches to breaking are skills that I've developed in other areas of my professional and personal life. While younger B-girls and B-boys learn how to be methodical through engagement with the dance, I arrived with an entire toolkit of organization, planning and analysis. I'm also realistic. While I've just about learned swipes and backspins, two of the most basic power moves, it's unlikely that I will ever progress to flares and 90s. Yet performance studies scholar Nanako Nakajima asserts that older dancers adjust the dance to fit their capacity. Therefore, instead of pursuing power, I focus on top rock, footwork and freezers. I try to make them clean and stylish and bring small innovations or personal touches to some of these moves as creativity represents a valued skill in the cipher. The tight place in which I am situated can be mined for all it is worth. In thinking through my place in the cipher, I'm not simply distant in age, but also in race and ethnicity. Although breaking represents a globalized practice with participants from diverse nations and backgrounds, including white European dancers, knowing that it was birthed through the African diaspora, I enter it from a place of privilege. It's not my automatic right to enter a cipher and that opportunity must be earned. Instead, I need to get to know the dance, its history, the local community of practitioners, their ways of knowing, moving, behaving, interacting for me to be accepted as a guest in the culture. To some degree, this involves dancing alongside each other, appreciating the physical demands that breaking places upon bodies, the skinned ankles and elbows, the rough calluses on the palms of our hands, the aching muscles that arrive without fail and the dripping sweat that glistens in huge droplets on the floor. I learned to greet people at training sessions, however introverted I might feel. I asked dancers for advice and mentorship to show me that I take the practice seriously. And although I'm a beginner, I know that I must bring energy to the cipher. Even if I don't throw around, I cannot be a passive bystander. I move with the groove, signal respect, and show expressions of affirmation. Beyond slowly building connection in and through the practice, I show up for the community, support events, and make my presence visible. Through time, I host practice sessions, help people design syllabi, recommend them for teaching gigs, write references, hire them as videographers, photographers, and transcribers, raise funds for projects, talk to people about their lives, and show care and interest where I can. I need to be sure that I'm not just taking from the culture, but I give back and share resources as much as I am able. Schloss explains that anyone who goes into the cipher is treated as an insider. It makes sense then why it's taken me so long to feel able to throw down with any degree of comfort and ease. Yet as I slowly build knowledge of the scene and relationships with people by being present and dancing at practice sessions, jams and battles, I gradually develop the courage to go into the circle. I dance my nascent and cautious sense of belonging and I can never take this for granted. I'm all too aware of the power imbalances at work, my privilege, my age, my professional status and my whiteness. And I'm equally conscious of my immaturity in relation to the dance, my cack handedness and lateness to the game. Together, this represents the tight place I occupy 
And to work within that space, I need to commit both to breaking and its community through presence, time and effort. In most ciphers, I witness signs of encouragement as all dancers understand the enormity of entering the circle and many appreciate the added stakes of being a female within a male dominated practice. I catch a nod of the head and a affirmative, an affirmative gesture, a call out. I see you S dot, I have moved and I keep on moving. I've progressed from the edge of the cipher into the center. I've advanced from an anxious neophyte who dreaded the moment when I might have to cipher to finding a pleasure and desire to share what I've learned so far from those that, that have generous, generously allowed me into their circle. And I realize that I have gained so much from making these moves. As a white, as a middle-aged woman, I sometimes feel invisible. My esteem plummets and my tendency is to withdraw. Yet in practicing strategy, command and deliberation of movement, slowly it seems to salvage my confidence. As Goldman suggests, improvisation requires training, preparation, knowledge and constraints. Before I could enter the freestyle space of the cipher, I needed to develop an understanding of the history and philosophy of breaking culture and to reflect upon the importance of circle-based structures in black expressive practices. I also needed to put in a lot of physical effort and to build up relationships through dancing alongside. Each time I enter the cipher, I negotiate the uncertain space that exists between accomplishment and failure. I do not sing, sit comfortably in middle life, but engage with bodies from different cultural and material circumstances. I dance alongside and in exchange with bodies that are removed in race, age, and usually ability and gender. And I take this opportunity seriously. I don't see it as a temporary passing or dalliance, but a full bodied engagement in the practices of this community. In participating in breaking ciphers, I confront who I am, my whiteness, my fear, my privilege, my limitations and my strengths. In turn, within the cipher, I'm met by other bodies who show me by example what I can learn from the dance, the culture and the community. Thankfully, I'm at least wise enough in years to appreciate how precious this is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Um, <laughs> I kind of wanted to go on forever, but I'm mindful that, you know, we've only got <laughs> 20 minutes, you know, probably telling me go on forever. Um, <laughs> you said that obviously age is performative and by goodness, you know, I, I would have never, you know, in terms of being 50 and being a B girl at 50, um, certainly, um, you know, you give people a run for their money in terms of, you know, sort of getting down and getting with uh, the movements. Um, there were certain things that really drew me in terms of you mentioned what happens when a white scholar comes to the cipher. Uh, a couple of points that you mentioned, tenacity to learn breaking, um, you know, and you you shared with us this idea of being it's a slow process, it's challenging, it's also painstaking. Um, I was interested that you also uh, add personal touches to the moves 
and that would be really in interesting um, to sort of, you know, um, hear a bit more about that, but also not just taking from the community, but giving back. And you talked about those employment. So lots of things that kind of went through my head. Um, I know that there's a question, Michelle, right? We've got somebody's jumped in on the, on the question to ask. Um, um, yes, and this is from uh, Jennifer. Um, as we're a small group, uh, Jennifer, do you want to come off mute and ask the question to Cheryl yourself? Um, hello, yes, hi. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I was just curious what other movement or dance practices you do to balance the breakdancing demands or just to generally care for your body. Thank you. Um, and thank you for Kat uh, to Katrina as well for giving quite a long response initially so I could catch my breath. <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, so yeah, thank you, um, Jennifer. To be honest, I do no ever dancers because the, uh, to do breaking takes up um, a a lot of my time but the thing I do have to do um to so my body can manage to keep up with it at some level is body conditioning so twice a week I do um you know all kinds of training with weights and resistance bands and stretching because early on I was getting injured quite a bit um I was just beginning to get all kinds of little aches and pains and although um, you know, I talk about a lot of the superficial things you get, like I've permanently got calluses on my hands from doing um, footwork. Um, I was beginning to get some niggles with my knees. I had a shoulder thing for a while. Um, so I've spoken to a couple of people with backgrounds in physical therapy about what I need to do to ensure I've got strength in the parts that matter for breaking. So yeah, I do do body conditioning. And then every now and again, I you know, we'll drop into a class in one of the other hip hop styles just for the fun of it. And I know it can also really feed into my breaking. So I find both house dance and the hip hop party dances to be really useful around top rock particularly. So I do a bit of that occasionally, but that's my limit. <laughs> Um, so, Cheryl, I have, I have another question that came directly mm. into me. So, yeah. it is, and I had to write it down on my post it. Um, have you experienced increased ethical barriers in your ethnographic research? So, you as going out there, I guess, doing the research, any mm. ethical barriers? Eth ethical ones. Mm. It's really interesting because although so I haven't it's this is one of the problems of zoom you always want to ask the person who asked the question for a bit of clarification or get more idea of what they're wanting to know but I'll try and answer it as best I can so in terms of things you know so to do eth ethnography in a university you need permission from some kind of ethics committee or institutional review board to do any kind of human subject res research so I've not found that there's greater um hurdles around the institutional ethical type review boards but I spent a lot of time thinking about the eth um, ethics of ethnography probably over the past th three or so years and although I used to be deeply invested in ethnography there's something about me as a middle-aged white woman who carries the privilege of a university position going into a community and not to, I don't want to oversimplify who that community is because there's a huge mix of people and there are, you know, within that community. But given that this dance came um, from, um, you know, a, a, a community that was without huge amounts of economic and social privilege, um, I'm always worried I reproduce an anthropological model of um, having a kind of coming in with a colonizing gaze. And I've been thinking a lot about 
you know, how I go about doing this. And actually, I rarely do any ethnographic work now. So I don't typically go in and take field notes. Once in a very occasionally, I will perhaps interview someone if um, I'm working on something that I think needs a bit more development. But now I primarily see my position as just a participant as a dancer and it feels much better doing that because for me dancing in the cypher is such a place of honesty I can't um you know having access to certain things does not help me being a be a better b girl I can't put up any facade about how much I know about hip hop or how much I know about breaking. People can see from how I dance. And it feels much better just turning up for sessions and engaging with the community in that way than coming in as an ethnographer because I, it, it always felt like there the continued to be this imbalance. And I know that reflects of ethnographies to try to think a lot about power dynamics, but for me, I still feel quite ill at ease. So one of the things I do is try keep trying to think the, about the ways in which I can give back, but also primarily position myself just really in, in the role of, of I guess, B-girl. And even that, I, I would have never called myself a B-girl, but after, I think about five years of dancing, eventually some of the, the folks I know were like, I think you need to get yourself a B-girl name. It's like time, which was for me a really important moment that I felt like I'd sort of shown my commitment to the community. And it was like saying, yeah, you are part of this, we see it. So, uh, sorry, I, that was a long answer. No, I, I, I think without the person coming back, I think that's a, a, a smiley face as to that answer. That, oh, we have a question from Jade. So, Jade, do you feel comfortable coming off mute and asking the question to Cheryl? Sure. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Um, I, I was just wondering, though, although you do consider yourself uh, a beginner to breaking, because you have so much knowledge of other dance styles and pedagogical knowledge, is there a context where you would feel comfortable in, in teaching breakdance now? So no, I would never ever teach breaking. Um, I do think having knowledge of other dance styles has, has helped me sometimes with things like figuring out coordination um or just understanding the mechanics of the body but quite honestly doing breaking is such a different style to the other ones i've learned they have not been any help whatsoever so breaking is often going down when some of the other styles i've done have gone up or breaking is um flexing the feet or turning in um rather than turning out and pointing the feet so the styles haven't helped my knowledge just as just of understanding the mechanics of the body and what it is to learn how to dance. I feel that's helped me a lot. Um, but I would never take, again, it's back to an ethical point, I'd never take the work of um, another experienced B-girl or B-boy teaching um, because I'm still so new to it. Although it is worth saying in breaking, it's taught in a different way. It, it doesn't tend, although I do go to a class, typically it's not taught or hasn't been taught in classes. And there's a, a philosophy in, in across the hip hop styles or within breaking specifically called each one teach one. And it's the idea that you pass on your knowledge and that everyone can be in the community sort of assisting each other. So it's a community oriented model of pedagogy. And I really appreciate that. So occasionally, um, you know, when I'm in a practice session, someone will come up and give me some tips. But if I see someone struggling with something that I've got to grips with, and amazingly, there's a few things I actually feel I've, I've just about got down now, you know, if it's an absolute beginner, I can maybe say to them, oh, have you tried this? Or I found it useful to do that. So I'd always be happy to pass on knowledge in that way, but I'd never want to teach a breaking class because my expertise isn't good enough. And there are plenty of other people who I think deserve to, to get 
those opportunities. But thank you, that's a really interesting question. Cheryl, I love the fact that you said you can get down with that step. And that's <laughs> such a, in terms of language, it's um, certainly thinking about when we first started, you know, uh, when I first um, certainly started this uh, conversation, we started way back when you were certainly working in England and now it's thinking about your trajectory over the last, um, certainly for me, 20 years, to see even the language <laughs> that you're using is so eclectic and so different. Um, I had one last thing I wanted to ask. I'm just mindful that um, we generally try to stop within the hour, but I had one last question about the personal touches to the moves and whether or not, uh, or where these personal touches, is it coming from you as the artist or indeed, if you move into other ciphers outside of Philadelphia, are there other personal touches cultural touches that might come in from one state to another or are you exclusively sort of thinking about just the Philadelphia scene? No so um, what I meant when I said about personal touches so there's great emphasis um, that there is you know a set of foundational moves which everyone knows and shares so um, you know for example I think I mentioned like the sixth step um, so the, there are these core moves that everyone knows. Um, but the idea is in, I think across the hip hop styles of dance, but again, I'll speak to breaking, is that you should show off something of who you are and bring your own individuality into it to stand out as a dancer. And it takes quite a while to get there because I think, you know, I was so busy just trying to learn some of these foundational moves to begin with. Um, but, so when I say personal touches, one of the things you should never do is bite someone, which means um, to steal their moves. So you shouldn't be stealing other people's original moves, but you should be trying to bring little flourishes and changes and things that make your movement a little bit distinctive. So I do spend quite a bit of time now, especially if I'm you know, going to go and enter a battle, to put together little sequences that I think are my own, that I've just tried to almost choreograph or try and bring just little touches that I think are very me rather than belonging to anyone else. Because one of the things people keep saying in breaking is you do you. And for ages, I felt I didn't know who I was in the dance, but I've got to a stage now where I try and do more of that. And I think all kinds of influences come in. I'm sure that I'm sure some of the other dance styles I've I've done in the past influence my overall style of movement. And yes, different cities or different nations do have um, some of their own vocabulary or um, innovations that they've brought. Um, you know, the, the, the thing with Philly is everyone says you should be able to dance. And that sounds an odd thing because the whole thing, of course, is a dance. But people want to see you really be able to groove to a, an entire track. And although you should be able to put some breaking into it, you should be able to know just how to move really well, especially in the upright position. So I've tried to work hard on just what, you know, everyone calls like being able to dance. But I spent so much time in Philly. I think that's probably my main influence and my immediate teachers. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I'm, uh, I feel like we could go on for a very long time, but I'm mindful that we'll close in just a short while. So um, thank you, Cheryl, for this uh, wonderful opportunity, oh, firstly to reconnect yeah. with you, but also to see where your work has moved on, you know, particularly through this um, B-Girl stage. And I, I must say, I was fascinated. I, I think it must have been about 11 p.m. a couple of months ago, maybe six months ago, and I, I hooked up into my, you know, iPhone, um, iPod, headphones in my ear listening in as you do it almost my eyes closed but just to hear the conversation between some of those b-boys and b-girls that you organized a few months ago and to really hear about them speaking you know their language and their movements and it was fascinating to kind of get an insight into that so thank you for enriching certainly my life um and i'm sure many many Aww. many others through your students um uh, and your colleagues and everyone else so thank you cheryl for that Thank you so much and thank you. I've not had a chance to read the chat, but I, I recognise some names and just to say a huge thank you to, to everyone who's come along. Um, yeah, I, I just always appreciate it so much. Thank you.